The first is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. The second is freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. The third is freedom from want, which translated into world terms means economic understandings which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life for its inhabitants everywhere in the world. The fourth is freedom from fear which translated into world terms means a worldwide reduction of armaments to such a point and in such a thorough fashion that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highness, uh, esteemed laureates, members of the Roosevelt family, uh, three generations of Roosevelt's today, Anne, Margaret, Eleanor and James, dear friends. On behalf of the Roosevelt Foundation, welcome in the Netherlands, welcome in Middelburg, welcome in Zeeland. In 1941, we saw it just before the direct involvement of the United States in the Second World War, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, summarized the preconditions, the preconditions for human dignity, the freedom of speech and expression, to be allowed and able to express yourself, to speak what you think, and, as I always add, think before you speak. The freedom to worship your gods or the freedom not to worship. The freedom from want to have food, water, clothing, shelter, access to medical care, the basic needs for life. And the freedom from fear of violence of any sort. In the past 80 years, the four freedoms and the ideals they represent have not lost their meaning. Every ceremony here, we say, they are still relevant today, especially today. We live in turbulent times with so many challenges that have a great impact. The wars and enormous human suffering in Ukraine, in Israel and Gaza, in Sudan, in conflicts in so many other places. The climate extremes in many parts of the world floods, droughts and forest fires, poverty and hunger, and millions of refugees desperately in search of safety. Increasing polarization shakes our societies. People are pitted against each other and truth is increasingly under pressure. How do we respond to this, which leaves so many people feeling powerless and uncertain? In these times of turmoil and uncertainty, the Four Freedoms can help us find the answers to today's challenges. Because the Four Freedoms are still the best definition of what human dignity means to us. And they still carry a powerful message which expresses itself, I think, in three ways. First, they offer us a moral compass to guide us in making the right choices, however complex and overwhelming today's challenges sometimes may be. Secondly, they give us a common, a common purpose, not biased against, but to fight for something, for human dignity for all, a common purpose 
that transcends regimes, political convictions and worldviews, a powerful value that connects us. And third, the four freedoms are a call to action for all of us at all levels of society that we have a role to play and a responsibility to fulfill. Eleanor Roosevelt was very aware of this when she said, where after all do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any map of the world. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerted citizens' action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. It starts at home, in our streets and neighborhoods, in our schools and offices. These are the places where we put the four freedoms in practice. And we must not forget that we live in a globalized world. The choices we make today and every day can have great impact and effect on the lives and human dignity of people elsewhere in the world. Today, the 2024 for Freedoms Awards laureates will tell us about their courage fight for freedom and for human dignity, about their efforts to defend and protect basic human rights. Each in their own way, they show in their life and work great dedication and commitment to defend and protect people's freedoms. They are all really an example for us. On behalf of the Roosevelt Foundation, the Roosevelt Institute in New York, and the members of the Roosevelt family, who I'm proud to say always joins, uh, join us here in Middleburg, I want to thank you, to thank you all for being here today and for committing to dedicate yourself to the four freedoms. I wish you all an inspiring ceremony. Thank you. I think if we don't take action against the real disinformation disorder that we're suffering from as a society, we just will have a situation where you can choose your own reality. You can just pick whatever you want to believe, have that reinforced, and then just live in that reality. And that's a real threat to democracy, and I think it's really important we take a stand against that and look at how we can stop that from happening. I started Bellingcat because there was a huge amount of information being shared from conflict zones by people who are risking their lives to capture this material, yet it was broadly being ignored by the media and part of that was because it couldn't be verified. So I set myself the task of verifying this and getting it out to the public because I recognised how important open source investigation can be, but I wanted to show more people how to do an open source investigation and give them a place where they could actually publish their own work. Bellingcat is unique because we have this very much community-led approach. We are not saying we are the gatekeepers to all information. We want to be part of communities where they're seeking the truth, that we can build ideas and investigation on fact-based evidence. And I think that's something that's really crucial about our work. It's not about just what Bellingcat does, but what people can do with the methodologies that we've developed on things that they care about and are interested in. The way that information is being used and misused at the moment it's very worrying to me and I hope that we can be part of the solution. When I first encountered the videos and evidence coming out about MH17, I thought that this is something that I can take those skills I've developed working on Syria over the last two years and apply them to this. There was already a lot of misinformation and confusion about what was happening, so establishing the truth based on facts, evidence and analysis was something that was very important. And what we're able to do is use publicly available evidence to show what had really happened. And I think it filled a space that otherwise would have been filled with disinformation and confusion. 
aside from the facts we revealed about the case and the details that we discovered, it was really spreading the ideas around open source investigations, seeing the accountability community use that, making people understand how valuable it is to have that information. And certainly with the invasion of Ukraine by Russia in 2022, we saw these ideas being applied very successfully to understand the conflict and to counter disinformation. We face a lot of opposition in our work. Unfortunately, the communities that emerge around different topics that are fueled by disinformation, they, they believe themselves to be truth seekers. They don't think they're spreading disinformation. But rather than getting kind of brought down with that, I'd like to think about how we've you know, if we weren't there, what would have happened? If you look at MH17, there would have been this whole information space filled with disinformation. Could have there been accountability? On the case of the many poisonings by Russia, I mean, would anyone have known really what had happened because of Bellingcat? My dream for Bellingcat and the work of open source investigation is we start connecting with communities, that we teach young people not just how to counter disinformation, but actually use these tools and these methodologies to investigate things they care about. We'll see citizens participating more in their democracies. You've seen more and more that ordinary people feel disconnected from politics, from the media, and I think really the work of Bellingcat, what we offer through open source investigation, can change that and make a huge difference to society. Your Majesties, dear friends, before I start, let me remind you that last night Ukraine was bombed again. Let that sink in while we sit here in this peaceful environment. The Moscow Times, founded three decades ago, has a long tradition of independent, fact-based journalism. We chronicled the fall of the Soviet Union, the chaos of the Yeltsin years, and Putin's repression. With a pen and a notebook in hand, we practiced old-fashioned journalism, interviewing sources, check and double-check, news and opinions separated. We were quite proud of ourselves. But then, 11 years ago, our world changed. A small group of what I called tech nerds published a report proving that Syrian dictator Assad was responsible for a chemical attack on Ghouta, a suburb of Damascus. They called themselves citizen journalists and introduced the acronym OSINT, open source intelligence. As a traditional journalist, I was intrigued and, to be honest, a little bit skeptical and somewhat jealous. Who were these people? Operating from home, not belonging to any official media organization, not bound by the rules we imposed upon ourselves, as journalists, and above all, magicians of the internet, with knowledge and tools we, as journalists, could only dream about. They called themselves Bellingcat, after a medieval fable called Belling the Cat, about mice who discuss how to make a cat harmless. Bellingcat became the disruptor of journalism, what Telsa did for cars. In the short video you saw, some of Bellingcat's amazing investigations, MA17, Skripal, Navalny, and just last week, a fabulous report on Gaza. But Bellingcat also identified Vladimir Krasikov, a FSB hitman serving now a life sentence in Germany after killing a Chechen opposition leader in Berlin. His fate is now closely linked to Evan Kerskovich, our friend, 
former Moscow Times reporter and now with the Wall Street Journal, held hostage over a year now in a Russian jail. A prison exchange between Evan and Krasikov is our only hope now to free Evan. With the Moscow Times, TV Rain, and other Russian independent media in exile, we fight now in Amsterdam our own cat and mouse war with the Kremlin. Not only in words, but technology has become the name of the game to gather information from afar and reach our audiences in Russia. Banning cats operations investigations continue to be groundbreaking. But even, even more important, maybe, Bellingcat showed us traditional journalists the way forward. Or to be more precise, forced us as journalists to reinvent ourselves and remain relevant as media. For this, we owe a huge thank you Elliot Higgins and the full Bellingcat team. The Four Freedoms Award for freedom of speech is well deserved, and I'm honored that I will be able now to hand this to you, Elliot. First of all, thank you for this award. It means a great deal to myself, the team at Ballincat, and our work. When I launched Ballincat 10 years ago, my hope was to spread the use of open source investigation and create a space for people to share their work. In the last 10 years, we've achieved that, and we've achieved so much more. One of the most important things to me is that we've created a community around open source investigation, which is a driver for our investigations as much as an audience for them. In that community, I see how we can become resilient against disinformation, the fracturing of opinion, and even reality that I've come to observe increasingly in society. The rapid technological changes of the last 15 years that began with the introduction of the iPhone and the rise of social media, which was so much part of Bellingcat's success, has also fueled the growth of other communities, built around reinforcing opinions and feeding the worst nature of discourse, fueling fear and distrust while offering a false sense of empowerment through the mutual anger towards those they believe have betrayed them. But we must examine why these communities exist. It is not because they have been lied to by Russia, but more often they believe they are truth seekers in a world where they felt betrayed by those who they have trusted. This can be the government, the media, and even medical professionals. And when people find like-minded communities, this ends up in cycles of reinforcement and radicalization. More often than not, the root sense of betrayal and mistrust is rooted in real causes. In my experience, the 2003 invasion of Iraq is still a touchstone moment for many people who now deny chemical weapons attacks in Syria. Seen through the lens of the betrayal of the public's trust in 2003, Syria is just a repeat of the same thing. And if you believe that, there are many people who will happily agree with you and reinforce that belief. We also need to understand that as a society, how we expect to be part of these conversations has changed. We no longer live in a media environment dominated by gatekeepers sitting at the top of a pyramid, sharing information they wish us to see, but a peer-to-peer -peer network where you can find people just like you with the same interests. Now here we have a great opportunity to involve everyone, especially young people, in the truth-seeking process. But it's not enough that the truth can be discovered. Without real change and accountability, to go alongside that, then the truth becomes just another stick to beat the other side over the head with in endless arguments that change nothing. Our goal must be to include everyone in these processes, not wait till they're 18, not wait until they've taken the right exams or got the right jobs, because my own personal history has shown time and time again that none of those are prerequisites to great impact and accountability. The structures of the past are cages, cages that some fearful of change would prefer to hide in. But I've seen what's possible when we come together as communities. 
and I hope the Freedom Award will help us make this vision come to fruition for everyone. Thank you. Creating harmony between different religious groups can be achieved by dialogue, but a meaningful dialogue, understanding that we share the same values, universal values of human rights, democracy, and uh, rule of law. And understanding that at the end of the day, we're all human beings and that we strive for a better world. I think that freedom of religion um, and belief is enshrined in my identity, in the identity of my people, the Uyghur people. Being Muslim, identifying as Muslim is a, a core part of our identity and this is exactly what the Chinese government is seeing as a threat and is using against us um, by um, imprisoning Uyghurs for their religious and ethnic identity. I was in Urumqi um, in July 2009 where I was visiting family for the summer when uh, the Urumqi uprising started on July 5th which followed an incident in a Chinese province where Uyghur uh, workers were um, killed. Thousands of people uh, were were killed. Um, every day we heard news of, of people who disappeared, of family, friends and people that we knew and this is where I realized that I myself, because of my religious and ethnic identity, I was discriminated against but also my people um, as well. The Chinese government is, is really using all kinds of methods to uh, subject Uyghurs to the worst atrocities. It started in 2017 with the uh, mass incarceration of up to 3 million of Uyghurs. There's also forced labor that is taking place that is um, obliging Uyghur workers to work in these repressive environments to produce garment and uh, all sorts of uh, produce and products to enter global supply chains. There's also mass uh, sort of separation of families where at least um, a million of Uyghur children are sent to Chinese boarding schools separated from their families and indoctrinated into uh, Chinese um, identity and, and culture and stripped away from their uh, mother tongue and um, Uyghur identity. And um, there are also four sterilization policies, that, especially after Xi Jinping's arrival to power. The four sterilization policies in the region have resulted in a sharp decline of birth rates, especially in uh, the southern regions where the birth rate has declined by 84% in some regions. My biggest fear at the moment is that my own advocacy will result in the detention and disappearance of my relatives back in Uzbekistan. We want freedom! I don't feel completely safe advocating for the rights of my people in, in the diaspora um, because of China's transnational repression where especially Uyghur activists are at huge risks of um, intimidation, harassment, um, especially by uh, family hostage diplomacies um, of the Chinese government. China terrorists! I am most proud of my Uyghur identity, um, belonging to this community. I think, especially in my community, um, the Uyghur youth is becoming an energetic, dynamic and powerful voice for change. I think um, we are extremely resilient as people, even though we're going through um, genocide and we come together to not only advocate for change, but also to preserve um, our rich heritage and, and culture. And that's something that is truly uh, special.
Your Majesties, dear friends, it's hard to imagine the suffering of the Uyghur people by the oppression in China. When a people is forced to abandon its religion, its language, its culture, it loses its soul. And for the Chinese government, there are no limits in order to reach this goal. As a consequence, the number of human rights violations is extreme. Dear Zumaretai, as chair of the Women's Committee and director of global advocacy of the World Hugo Congress, you have been and you still are crucial in facilitating women in activism to connect the Yugo diaspora, to support refugees. By doing so, you have made a huge difference. On top of that, you show the world how important it is not to accept violations of human rights and to fight for justice and dignity. May this award support you to continue your fight against the assimilation of Uyghur people. In his famous address, President Roosevelt stated, freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. Our support goes to those who struggle to gain those rights and to keep them. And this, in my view, is exactly what today's ceremony is about. It reminds us of the need for global solidarity and the need to hold perpetrators accountable. I hope, Sumeratai, your example inspires all others here present to fight injustice anywhere and to defend the freedom of religion, language and culture everywhere. Could I invite you to the stage? Religious identity is not a crime. Your Maj Majesties, Your Royal Highness, Prime Minister, Roosevelt Foundation, members of the Roosevelt family, ladies and gentlemen. I am deeply humbled to receive this year's Freedom of Worship Award, an award that I accept on behalf of my community. I stand before you to underscore the vital importance of defending religious freedom, a cornerstone of any free and democratic society. Religious freedom is not merely a concept it is a fundamental human right, one that lies at the heart of our values and beliefs. Yet despite its paramount importance, religious freedom is under threat in many parts of the world. We witness the persecution of religious groups, the suppression of dissenting voices, and the imposition of draconian laws that restrict freedom of worship. Such actions not only violate basic human rights, but also undermine the fabric of our societies, sowing seeds of discord and division. Imagine being born Uyghur and knowing that you are condemned for life, no matter what you do or what you don't do. Your ethno-religious identity has been criminalized by the state. The existing laws, practices, and social conducts are all designed to make you guilty of something that you're not. Being born Uyghur should not be a crime. But in today's world, Uyghurs are being locked en masse in extrajudicial camps, subjected to the worst address atrocities one can imagine, including rape and torture, forced labor, and more. Places of worship and other sacred places, including 16,000 mosques, have been destroyed in the name of national security. Today, the Chinese government has started its campaign to fully assimilate Uyghurs into the accepted unique Han Chinese identity by uprooting Uyghurs of their cultural, linguistic, and religious identity. Me standing here accepting this prestigious award is a strong message to Beijing that we will not be silenced. 
The persecution of Uyghurs is not merely a domestic issue confined to the borders of China. It is a matter of global concern that demands our collective action and solidarity. As members of the international community, we cannot remain silent in the face of such egregious human rights abuses. We must uphold the Chinese government to account for its action and demand an end to the repression of religious freedom and genocide in my homeland, East Turkestan. I would also like to show my deep gratitude to my mentor, Dolkun Isa, President of the World Congress, who is with us today. He taught me what it means to sacrifice your own needs in the pursuit of freedom and human rights. And I want to end with a poem called No Road Back Home by prominent Uyghur poet Abdul Qadir Jalaluddin, who has been detained as part of the campaign against Uyghur scholars and intellectuals started in 2017. Bir bulunda yigane men nigarim yok, keçileri qara basti tumarim yok, bu hayatın özge yana humarim yok, cimcitlıqta xiyal ezdi amalim yok. Men kim idim nimi buldum bilelmedim, kim gidey men dil sözümni diyelmedim, ya peleknin huy peylini sözelmedim, yar kışınga baray dey men kararim yok. In this forgotten place, I have no lover's touch. Each night brings darker dreams. I have no amulet. My life is all I ask. I have no other thirst. These silent thoughts torment. I have no way to hope. Who I was once, what I've become, I cannot know. Who could I tell my heart's desires? I cannot say. My love, the temper of the fates, I cannot guess. I long to go to you. I have no strength to move. Thank you so much. While I saw you, my Stories of heroes and glory 
in a new world singing songs about the age of coffee sugar and gold we hold our dreams in our mind the future is in our hands but it will take some time to reach the promised land we hold our dreams the future is in our hands But it will take some time To reach the promised land Gold, gold Everywhere we go, we see gold. Gold, gold, everywhere we go, we see gold. But we are no children of ignorance. We were told what we know, led by the light of what is to come. We will rise. Our own future in God. Thank you. essa negação ao território. Acho que essa é a maior injustiça que o Estado brasileiro ainda mantém né, é, contra os povos indígenas. Mas acho que, que eu me identifiquei como uma liderança ativista já foi já mais de 20 anos, né? Eu já tinha mais de 20 anos quando realmente eu consegui acompanhar de perto a luta dentro do movimento indígena. Que aí comecei no meu estado, eu já era adulta quando realmente eu entendi que eu estava fazendo parte né, de, de, de um coletivo de pessoas que lutavam pela mesma causa. A luta pela terra, a luta em defesa dos direitos dos povos indígenas, a luta por respeito, justiça, né? É o que eu faço todos os dias. Mas acho que para adquirir qualquer um desses, para nós, povos indígenas, né, em primeiro lugar, é a luta pela terra. Eu luto com o povo, né? Contra todos aqueles que tentam nos oprimir, que tentam impor, né? Ou nos manter no anonimato. Então, acho que a nossa luta maior é contra o poder político e contra o poder econômico. E eu não poderia deixar de dizer também contra o racismo, né, que ainda é muito vivo, é muito impregnado naturalmente nas pessoas. O Brasil teve um processo de colonização muito violento, né, sempre muito explorador, sempre muito predatório com a terra, né, com o uso da terra. E isso fez com que, em um período, o período da ditadura militar, né, é, foi muito sangrento com os povos indígenas, onde foram dados título de posses a fazendeiros, a, a agronegócio, né, e, que foram as terras indígenas. A presença indígena é, é garantia de água limpa, né, de alimentação sem veneno, é garantia de floresta em pé, de uso sustentável do solo. Né, e hoje o mundo inteiro discute como é, reduzir ou como conter as mudanças climáticas, que é de território indígena protegido aqui e acaba sendo né, 
é, um benefício para o mundo inteiro. E se nós, povos indígenas, significamos né, apenas 5% da população mundial e protegemos 82% da biodiversidade viva no mundo, né, então isso quer dizer que nós temos um trabalho muito né, importante para o planeta. E as pessoas precisam entender isso. Né? Parece que não consegue ainda encontrar né, nessa, né, nas mudanças climáticas já uma ameaça real, né? o fim de tudo. Né? Então, é realmente um momento de, de se pensar, né, de refletir o que nós queremos para o futuro ou que futuro queremos né, e, e pensar nas próximas gerações. Acho que é, hoje a responsabilidade é nossa, né? Nós estamos com uma responsabilidade muito grande de evitar esse ponto de não retorno. Então, é um envolvimento que precisa ser né, articulado com todas as pessoas. Sociedade civil, governos, empresas, cada um cumprindo a sua parte. Porque ninguém chega a lugar nenhum sozinho, né? Ninguém consegue mudar o mundo sozinho. É preciso sempre trazer o coletivo. Eu, eu valorizo muito né, essa luta coletiva. E eu penso que, que a gente só vai conseguir essa transformação de consciência no mundo, né? Quando ente, entendermos né, que é somente o coletivo que traz essa possibilidade. Your Majesties, Your Excellencies, and everyone here today. When I think about our next laureate for the Four Freedoms Award, three things instantly come to mind. A warrior, a protector, and an incredible role model for so many around the world. Minister Sonia has a lifetime of activism behind her. And in the video you see, she shares that her story as an activist started when she was 20 years old. I'm proud, as a 23-year-old, to be standing here today, sharing the story of a leader who each day leads by example, and has become a prominent voice for our lands, our forest, the indigenous community, and the world of sustainability. Sonia, your political career and now your role as Brazil's first minister of indigenous people shows that it's not only your work being inspiring, but it shows also how necessary the ancestral knowledge of indigenous people and traditional communities is critical to stop the advance of climate change. It also shows the interconnectedness of all of our challenges around the world, the interconnectedness of all the four freedoms. And of course, as well, the power and message of intergenerational collaboration. We will not solve the problem with the same thinking that created it. So for me, from an island girl like me, who has been trying to create change since age 12 already, you have reminded me that leading from your heart with vision and focus is the only way forward. If only more leaders were like Sonia, I believe we would see real, scalable change happen and start now. It is an honor for me to present the Four Freedoms Freedom From Want Award to Sonia.
Bom dia a todas e todos. Saúdo vossas majestades, rei William, Alexander e rainha Máxima, sua alteza, princesa Beatrix, excelências, primeiro-ministro, demais autoridades aqui presentes. Estimados laureados, membros da família Roosevelt e organizadores deste tradicional, desta tradicional premiação. Eu estou muito orgulhosa por estar presente e receber esta homenagem tão importante. No Brasil, apenas o presidente Lula havia sido laureado. É momento de orgulho, porque sei de tantas dificuldades que passei, tantas dores tive com as derrotas e perdas de amigos queridos por estar nesta jornada. É motivo de mais orgulho ainda receber este prêmio enquanto primeira-ministra dos povos indígenas no Brasil. Tanto o prêmio quanto o cargo que hoje ocupo diz respeito à minha trajetória no movimento indígena, pelos direitos do povo à vida, à cultura, ao seu território tradicional. Mas, justamente por se tratar da minha trajetória no movimento indígena, acredito que esse também é um prêmio do movimento. Tornei-me ativista indígena porque morava no meu território, em Araribóia, no interior do Maranhão, um dos estados mais pobres do Brasil. Só me tornei defensora dos direitos humanos quando vi pessoas sendo criminalizadas por serem indígenas como eu, por viverem sua cultura em seus territórios, morrerem pelo desmatamento e mineração ilegal ou por venenos de empresas de agronegócio. Comecei a falar ao mundo sobre esperança quando tive a certeza de que os modos de vida indígenas e as nossas relações com a Mãe Terra são essenciais para salvar o planeta na sua longa luta contra as alterações climáticas. Então, esse é um prêmio para todo o movimento indígena brasileiro. Movimento que comemora marcos importantes, como este ministério, mas que ainda recebe inúmeros ataques e sofre graves derrotas. Este prêmio nos pede mais coragem e disposição para enfrentar as estruturas de morte que ainda existem para os povos indígenas e tantos outros povos ameaçados no planeta. O Brasil está entre os principais países que matam defensores ambientais e de direitos humanos. A pobreza e o suicídio entre os povos indígenas que não têm seu território protegido ainda é enorme. Enquanto vemos um genocídio ocorrendo na Palestina, também há pessoas no Brasil sofrendo ataques como este. Defender o povo Yanomami é uma das prioridades do presidente Lula mas é uma guerra longa e forte. Setores como a mineração e o desmatamento ilegal ainda são fortes. Eles ameaçam os nossos direitos e destroem a Mãe Terra. Reforço aqui o compromisso de que iremos enfrentá-los, mas precisamos de parceria e colaboração para enfrentarmos juntos. A luta do Ministério e dos povos indígenas é uma luta que une a defesa dos direitos humanos com a luta do meio ambiente. É uma luta ancestral que busca reconhecer os territórios e saberes ancestrais para que a biodiversidade possa ser preservada e um modelo justo e saudável para que o mundo possa ser promovido. 
uma luta que procura colocar a justiça climática no centro do debate. Portanto, estou grata por este prêmio. É mais uma fonte de inspiração para continuar buscando a liberdade para um novo mundo. Liberdade para querer o bem viver do nosso povo. Muito obrigada. Freedom from fear essentially is a life free from persecution and exploitation. These are basic things that are the foundation on which someone can build a free and full life. The world we're living in today is not free from war. It's not free from even civilians being protected from fear in conflict zones. Modern slavery is an umbrella term that describes a number of highly exploitative practices, including forced labor, forced marriage, human trafficking, debt bondage, and state-imposed forced labor. I encountered modern slavery for the first time as a concept when I was 14 years old. I had an opportunity to work with children who'd been rescued from child sex trafficking, some as young as three years old. That experience fundamentally shifted my perspective of the world as well as my place in it. The idea that any person, let alone any child, could be bought and sold like a commodity was a horror that I could never turn away from. I have witnessed human suffering in the form of modern slavery in many forms. I have met mothers who felt they had no choice but to marry their very young daughters off because they felt it was the only way they would be protected in refugee camps. They literally said to me they felt it would be better for their daughter to have one predator instead of multiple. I've worked with an activist from India who first told me about organ trafficking in the form of corneas from baby girls in India children who had been sold to orphanages and bought simply for their cornea and then dumped. A major misconception of modern slavery is that it only happens over there. The truth is, there is no over there in a globalised world. We are all connected to each other through the global supply chains in which we buy and use things every day. The world that we live in benefits some at the expense of others, and that is how our global economy works. When I was in Ghana a number of years ago, a senior faith leader there said to me, where once our people were shipped across the sea as commodity, now commodities are shipped across the sea, still made by our people living in modern slavery. This could be as close as the cotton in the shirt on your back. The coffee you drank this morning, the technology that we speak on today, the truth is that modern slavery is prevalent and persistent in many parts of our economy. One of the biggest challenges we face at Walk Free is that while modern slavery vulnerability is on the rise, the political will to match that is diminishing. We need leaders to step up and tackle modern slavery as the intersectional issue that it is, intersecting with the climate crisis, intersecting with global migration pathways, intersecting with conflict, intersecting with the rights of women and girls. Because if modern slavery is allowed to exist in the world, we will never have a world that is free from fear. Walk Free created the Global Slavery Index because you cannot solve an issue unless you can understand the scale of it. There wasn't a data set like this in the world. It is both a quantitative and qualitative data set that looks at the number of people living in modern slavery in 160 countries. The index also looks at government response to modern slavery. And still, in 2024, we can tell you that no government is effectively responding to modern slavery. My dream is to see prime ministers and presidents throughout the world take this issue up as the issue of their time. And we need leaders to step up and take accountability for the actions of people, people in positions of power, who are harming people and planet at a rate that we not only need to slow down, but need to stop.
Your Majesties, Excellencies, and dear friends, I am very honored to present the Freedom From Fear Award this morning. As an artist, I am deeply inspired by people who dedicate their lives to the liberation of others. The song I sang earlier today, Gold, is about the colonial history of the Netherlands and the dark slavery practices that accompanied it. As a descendant of enslaved Africans who were stolen from their homes, sold and forced to work on the plantations in the New World, it is incredibly, incredibly painful and disturbing to realize that slavery is unfortun unfortunately not a thing of the past, but a cruel reality for too many human beings living on this planet at this very moment. I am, however, filled to the brim with hope and faith in the power of humanity, knowing that someone like Grace Forrest exists and fights to eradicate those inhumane conditions. Grace, congratulations, and thank you for all of your hard work, your passion, your dedication, and for inspiring us all to do more, to not look away, but to act in pursuit of true freedom. For there is, as I, I hope we all believe, no true freedom until we are all free. Dear guests, put your hands together for Grace Forrest. Your Majesties, Royal Highness, Excellencies, and esteemed laureates, and members of the Roosevelt family, it is an immense honor to be here today. I would also like to acknowledge my parents, who from an early age taught me to do what I can with what I have, to speak up against injustice, and to always stand up for others. I am honored to receive the Freedom From Fear Award, which I accept on behalf of the Walk Free team. We dedicate this award to all survivors whose expertise and leadership are paramount to the movement against modern slavery. It is an honour to learn from them and work alongside them. Freedom from fear, in its simplest form, is the freedom to choose. Today, there are 50 million people living in modern slavery, all of whom do not have that most basic freedom. Eradicating modern slavery is central to a broader fight for justice, whether it be the climate crisis, protracted conflict, or the oppression of ethnic minorities, all of which are reflected through the work of my fellow laureates, whom I deeply respect and stand with in solidarity. Modern slavery intersects with the world's most urgent problems. It exists today on an unprecedented scale, occurring in every region of the world. It is being fueled by 20 of the world's richest nations, responsible for 75% of global trade and billions of dollars worth of imports made by people living in forced and child labour each year. From the shirt on your back to the technology we speak on daily, every person in this room is connected to exploitation. The exploitation we see in today's economy is by default, is not by default, but by design. It follows a story shaped by systemic inequality, a direct legacy of colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade, both of which have left lasting imbalances and scars in our modern world. Where people were once shipped across the seas as commodities, now commodities are shipped across seas still produced by people living in slavery. From cotton, to sugar, to rare earths, to tobacco. Industries that thrived under historical slavery continue to thrive on forced and child labour today. This begs the question, did wealthy countries abolish these problems or simply outsource them? There is a dangerous tendency to confine the most atrocious parts of human history to some bygone era, as though the worst is behind us. Not only is this simply untrue, but it undercuts the urgent need for systemic change 
and minimises the vast scale of harm happening today. It means we can condemn chattel slavery and pat ourselves on the back for having abolished the slave trade, all while continuing to rely on forced labour connected to our clothes, food and much of our modern technology. Seventy-five years ago, Eleanor Roosevelt drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a framework that stated each person was born with inherent, fundamental human rights. Not long after, the Geneva Conventions were finalised, setting a new standard of international law, whereby children, civilians and aid workers were to be shielded from the horrors of war. Today, there are clear breaches of those frameworks all over the world. When leaders do not abide by the international standards of which they are willing signatories, we are left with a world that values the paper on which laws are written more than the lives of those they were written to protect. The failure to enact international law anywhere is a failure to enact it everywhere, and currently we are seeing it fail in real time. From Gaza, where people are experiencing unprecedented levels of fear, we must continue to not just advocate for their urgent safety, but for their freedom. From Xinjiang, where the Uyghur people are living under state-imposed forced labour connected to the global demand for solar panels and wind turbines, we must prioritise their rights in tandem with the need for a green transition. From securing the rights to every woman and girl, ensuring that she is never forced to marry against her will, or as an alternate to her education. Each one of these situations represents a failure to abide by international law and uphold human rights as universal, inalienable and indivisible. Systemic problems require systemic solutions. Systemic solutions require understanding how our history is connected to ongoing injustices and how these injustices are reflected in our global modern economy. Today and together, sorry, excuse me. Together, we truly could be the last generation living with slavery because eradicating modern slavery is something within our reach. Starting with just 20 of the world's most powerful nations, we could change our global supply chains to shift from opaque and exploitative to transparent and accountable for the basic human rights of all people. International law either applies to all of us or none of us. Collectively, we must ensure human rights are, in, are an intrinsic reality for all people, as they were, after all, originally intended. History is calling. It is up to us how we answer. Thank you.
the biggest injustice is that our children lived at home on their land and had a normal childhood and then Russia's came. Instead of killing Ukrainian children on the spot, they abducted and become Russians. They militarized children in order to make Russian mercenaries from them and to send them to the future Russia's war conflict as Russian soldiers. Our kids are hostages in Russia and occupied territories, and they are treated like hostages. We are the only aid organization that regularly organizes rescue missions to return abducted children to Ukraine and those children who are suffering and the Russian authority in occupied territories. We achieve our goals by united dozens of organizations and hundreds of volunteers. Our dream for the future is to see our Ukrainian children at home, surrounded by loving families. We won't rest until we know that no Ukrainian child suffers from separation from their family and lives under the pressure of Russian propaganda, indoctrination and militarization. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highness, Ambassadors, dear friends. One of the best known people in Dutch history is Anna Frank. Just an ordinary Jewish girl. No doubt you are familiar with her. Or rather, you are familiar with her diary, in which she described her life in hiding with her family during the Second World War. Many millions of copies have been sold worldwide. And the reason is that Anna's story is not simply about the horrors of the war. Above all, it is a story of hope. It's about seeing light in darkness. Or, as Anna herself put it, look at how a single candle can both defy and define the darkness. Those words have lost none of their wisdom in the years since they were written. Because today, in our time, there is still darkness in many places around the world. The reason I'm here today is to shine a light on one of the places it is needed most, Ukraine. Since Russia's brutal invasion over two years ago now, thousands of Ukrainian children have been abducted and taken to Russia or to areas occupied by Russia. <coughs> thousands of children ripped away not only from their parents, but from everything that made them who they are. Their language, their country, their identity. With their abduction, their identities have been erased or made invisible. The victims themselves are still alive in most cases, at least physically. This is one of the worst crimes we can imagine, targeting the most vulnerable people, children and their parents. And in this dark reality, Save Ukraine is a candle defying the darkness. In 2014, when Russia began its aggression against Ukraine, Mykola Kuleba decided that he would not stand idly by. He would not just wait and see what happened. He would do all he could 
to fight back. He would give everything he had with anyone who would join him. And as so often happens with people who stand up to evil, he was soon joined by others willing to help. To bring kidnapped children back home and to evacuate vulnerable people from the most dangerous areas. And so that one flickering candle grew into what is now a blazing beacon of hope for Ukrainian parents. A rescue of vulnerable people on the front lines of the war. Already over 100,000 vulnerable people have been evacuated from combat zones. Thanks to Save Ukraine, 282 children have been safely returned to their homeland. And together with their parents, they can find some rest in one of the organization's seven hope and healing centers. There they can heal from their psychological wounds. Or at least they can start to heal. Yes, of course, more needs to be done. Unfortunately, the end of this terrible war is not yet in sight. But we can all draw hope from these acts of resistance, big and small. Every child saved is living proof of Putin's war crimes. And he knows that. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Kinsch Commissioner already reminded us, Eleanor Roosevelt once said, where do universal human rights begin? And the answer? In small places, close to home. Save Ukraine demonstrates the truth of those words by taking a stand when human rights are violated, by turning despair into hope, but above all by showing in practice that everyone can be human rights defenders. Everyone, even when peace and justice seem far away, especially then. Mikola and James, the importance of defending human rights is a strong threat running through your lives and your families. So let me now ask you both to come to the stage so that James can present Mikola with the International Four Freedoms Award for Safe Ukraine. Majesties, Prime Minister, Ambassadors, Roosevelt family, friends. My English not so good. I decided to give my speech in Dutch. Ik ben blind on air year to Zane for the Fear Freedom Awards. Thank you. Prime Minister supported with my Dutch. Me. I am pleased to be joining you here in the Netherlands. I'd like to thank you, Roosevelt Foundation, for this honor and extend my congratulations to other laureates. You are my heroes. Love you guys. Thank you. You heard now a lot about Save Ukraine, what we are doing, and our nonprofit. It is 400 dedicated heroes organization has returned more kidnapped Ukrainian children than any other organization. We also work to rehabilitate and reintegrate all Ukrainian children and families affected by the war. 
I am joined today by two of the brave young people that save Ukraine help rescue following their abduction by Russia, Ksenia and Rostislav. I'd like to dedicate this award to the strength and courage of all Ukrainian youth, including the thousands of children who still need to be rescued and rehabilitated after their traumatic experience in Russia. The International for Freedom Award highlights the importance of freedom as essential to upholding democracy. This award underscores that Ukrainian sovereignty is key to the preservation of democracy in all of Europe. And to protect Ukrainian democracy, we must protect our children. I'd like to spend a few minutes sharing with you all about what is happening in the Russian occupied areas of Ukraine, how organizations like Save Ukraine are helping, and the role that you can play to advance this work. In 2014, the Russian Federation started a genocidal war against our country and our people when it occupied Crimea and Donbass. And from 2014 to today, almost 20% of our children have disappeared in Ukraine. These children remain in the occupied territories or were forcibly transferred to Russia with or without their family what is kidnapping. To date, Save Ukraine has rescued and returned 282 kids of those children to Ukraine, but the magnitude of the problem is enormous. The official number of children abducted to Russia, whom Ukrainian government identified more than 19,000, but Russian authorities said that over the past two years, almost 750,000 Ukrainian children have been registered in Russia, which means that they were given Russian citizenship and officially Russified. The Russian government uses very powerful propaganda techniques to weaken the children's Ukrainian identity, is distance them from their families and their culture. I'd like to share with you Ksenia's and Rostislav's stories who now are part of Ukrainian's resilient generation. Ksenia and her younger brother were forcibly taken to Russia and then separated. Her brother was placed with the Russian family. Ksenia was sent to Russian school, but was kicked out when she refused to accept Russian citizenship. When she eventually found her little brother, he was 10 that time, he was being subjected to intense pressure by the Russians to abandon his Ukrainian identity. The brainwashing was so intense that he didn't even want to return with her sister back to Ukraine. Only through Ksenia's incredible determination and bravery and with Save Ukraine support was she able to recover her brother and make the journey back to Ukraine together. Thank you, Senia, for your bravery. And Rostislav was in a little village in Ukraine on occupied territory. His grandmother died from heart attack. Shortly after, his mother suffered from mental illness and the occupiers forced her to accept Russian citizenship and check into a psychiatric hospital in Russia. For four months, Rostislav, a teenager, lived alone, terrified with little food or money. However, he graduated from the ninth grade and then worked in an orchard in his village. When the Russians realized he was alone, they forcefully took him to a camp with other children where they tried to brainwash him into, into hating Ukraine and the West. One day when he refused to sign the Russian, Russian national anthem 
and as a punishment, the Russians conf confined him into a two by two meters cell with a covered window and no telephone for multiple days and night. He again was all alone, terrified. At a different time, in an effort to erase his Ukrainian identity, they gave him a Russian birth certificate, which he destroyed. He again found himself in a small isolated room. They threw him into solitary isolation four times for a total of 15 days. Eventually, his friend's mother discovered Save Ukraine, who helped Rostislav escape and return to his homeland. Thank you, Rostislav, for your bravery. Save, U Save Ukraine is focused on two things, rescuing as many kids as possible, as quickly as possible, and supporting Ukraine's children and their families to build positive and productive lives despite the ongoing conflict. Our team, as you heard, rescued from combat zones more than 100,000 children, women, and the elderly. We have services, child care and family services, hope and healing centers, education and empowerment community centers. We provide hot meals, education, trauma therapy, legal, social support. We have a team I'm very thankful for, for guys doing every day with these children. And our work is far from over. Our vision is not that Ukraine to return to our post-Soviet past, is to rebuild our country, to build better future, where every child is valuable and live in loving and supportive family. If there is one thing you should remember from today, it should be this, the Russia Federation is committing a genocide of the Ukrainian nation. And it is seeking to do this in two ways, by forcibly transferring our children to Russia and annihilating their Ukrainian identity, both in Russia and occupied territories. We urge you to support Ukraine and hold this responsible and accountable, ensuring their survival of our people and the preservation of our culture. I also ask you to please share this young people's stories on social media. The world deserves to hear their stories. Thank you for your support and for continuing to stand side by side with Ukraine. Freedom for all Ukrainian children. Slava Ukraini! Your Majesties, Your Royal Highness, King's Commissioner Pullman, honored laureates and distinguished guests. Once again, it is a privilege to speak to you on behalf of my family and our delegation from the Roosevelt Institute in New York, including the trustees of the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Presidential Library. It is always a joy to be here in Milburg. Since 1982, we have <clears throat> together been recognizing <clears throat> humanitarian heroes who have turned their ordinary lives into extraordinary examples of courage, truth-telling, bravery, and hope. 
We are honored by the laureates' presence here and inspired by their witness. It cannot escape any of us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Delightful, thank you. <clears throat> it cannot escape any of us that we are living through a very frightening and perplexing time. It may even seem unique, like no other era before. I would assume, however, that those who live through these crises, these crises of societal organization, always feel like their times are like no other. In each terrible time, there was one or many innovations that tipped the scales of danger and pain, just as we are contending with technology that threatens our sense of what is true. So perhaps we just need to get up and square our shoulders and deal with it. That's what our laureates are doing every day. And so we should, too. But I want to make one note. I am so acutely aware of the elements of our global popular culture that are dystopian, visualizing for us in brilliant technological ways how gray, smoky, cruel, hateful, horrifying, and terrible the future is bound to be. I know it is fiction, whether in film or print or music or social media, but we are seeing every day that not all of us are able to compartmentalize this scary vision of our future in this universe. Depression, sadness, malaise, selfishness, copycat behavior are tragically becoming normalized. When the news of yet another mass shooting, hateful demonstration, or attack in response to bullying comes across our news feed, how many of us are plunged into grief anymore? It's happening all the time. Our natural response of grief is quelled because we cannot spare the personal, emotional resources over and over and over again. Well, I would ask you to look around. And today, we here can put a stop to that. We may be a small company here, but it is a place to start. Let us remember the joy of these laureates' courage not just their actions, but their love of humankind. Let us remember the beauty of this setting and this company that honors their passionate approach to healing a hurting world. Let us remember the relationships represented here that give us a structure for strength and change. Let us remember the power of love and beauty and joy and passion on behalf of equity, fairness, justice, and peace. I am grateful for this experience today because tonight 
there will be some terrible thing happening somewhere in the world, threatening to create a fear of living within me. But I will remember their joy, their beauty, their courage, their determination, and their passion. And that will be my vision of the future, not the terror-soaked vision playing out on our screens and pages. I hope that you also will go forth with a similar message because we together, whether in small ways or large ways, have the power to create the world we want for our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, esteemed laureates, members of the Roosevelt family, dear friends, and you give us again hope. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was an honor to welcome you here in Zeeland, our beloved land in the sea. Uh, and you know, I often say, Zeeland is not land's end, but also today the beginning of the world. I would like to thank you all, the laureates, the inspiring words, the inspiring actions, the hopeful word, words we shared here today. Uh, they inspire us and you all in our efforts to make a better future for everyone, everywhere in the world. You, we, we can make a difference. It's all about the personal choices we make at home, work, school, neighborhoods, as we told. We must keep reminding ourselves, as the laureates did today with their inspiring example, what our definition of victory is. Victory is the supremacy of human rights everywhere and a dignified life for everyone without distinction of any kind. We are fighting for something, not against, and our will and commitment to, me, to make people's lives better should unite us and make us strong. Nelson Mandela, our former laureate, said that to be free is not merely to cast off one's change, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. Together with you, the Roosevelt Foundation and the Roosevelt Institute, we will continue to promote the four freedoms. We want to thank the laureates and today's presenters. We want to thank you, dear friends, for your support. We will soon move to lunch. Please remain seated whilst the royal family, the laureates, and the presenters leave the church first, and then please follow the instructions you will, you will have. Thank you so much. Thank you.